steam locomotives in miniature at the steam workshop. This is part 11. Refitting the Walschartz valve gear, which was invented by a Belgian railway mechanical engineer by the name of Walschartz in 1844. This is the reversing lever, which starts a sequence of events to make the engine go backwards and forwards. In this clip I'm applying some thread lock, which holds the threaded pin in place. The reversing assembly is very easy to get to, but when all the cabs are refitted and the tanks are refitted to the engine, it won't be so easy to get to this part, so I'm going to make sure that this pin doesn't vibrate loose and fall out once the engine is fully assembled, hence the use of the thread locking compound. This is not thread locking compound by the way, this is oil and plenty of it. You will notice that there is writing appearing on the screen as if by magic, to show everyone what all these parts are called. On the bench at the moment are both sides of the valve gear, so I'm taking this opportunity to oil every one of the parts, and there are quite a lot of moving parts in the Walshirts valve gear. I think I've got the pronunciation right, I always call it Walshirts, but I think it is actually pronounced Walshirts. Here are all the parts, the anchor link, the combination lever, the radius rod with its lifting link, and this lifts the radius rod up and down through the expansion link. All of these parts work in harmony to control the forward and reverse direction of the steam engine. Unlike Stevenson's link valve gear, Walshart's valve gear only has one eccentric. And here it is. It's called a return crank, and it's on the outside of the crank pin. And the return crank is connected to the eccentric rod, which is connected to the expansion link. All of these parts are just as they were left as I finished cleaning them up. Initially, I removed them from the engine very carefully and then put them into the bead blaster to get rid of the years of rust and grime. Although before using the bead blaster, they spent a couple of days in a pot of cellulose thinners, or lacquer thinner. And I even put them back in the cellulose thinners after the bead blasting operation. I'm just making sure that everything moves freely. It would not be good if the die block didn't move freely up and down the expansion link. And don't forget, I didn't build this engine and know nothing about it. It's very well made, but there could be a problem, and it felt initially like it was sticking in the expansion link, but after applying a little more oil and moving the die block up and down several times, it's now very free. A die block, by the way, is a rectangular piece of metal, but it's shaped to fit exactly in the expansion link slot, and it slides up and down, and this is fitted to one end of the radius rod. Time now to assemble the valve gear on the engine. Once again, I'm oiling the parts. This is the bearing support on the motion bracket that supports the expansion link. So off we go, putting the parts back together. I notice that there is so little wear on these pins and bearing surfaces that this engine cannot have done much running. And the fact that the suspension was far too hard probably meant that it was forever falling off the track. And I think that's maybe something to do with why this engine ended up in a barn, literally in a barn. I'm quite looking forward to running this engine to see how well it runs, because it's very well built. This job was made more difficult because I forgot my toolbox, I left it at home, and it would have been a little bit easier if I'd have remembered to bring my toolbox with my backhoe spanner and my BA socket set. Luckily, there are various tins of tools dotted about the steam workshop, so it was not a big problem. There are quite a few of those very cheap spanner sets that are available from Blackgate's Engineering, and they really are excellent. They're not nicely finished, they're not chrome vanadium, but they work very well indeed, particularly the right-angled, open-ended type. Throughout this operation, there's a lot of oiling going on. Here, I'm fitting the outer bearing to the motion bracket, which supports the expansion link. I haven't painted this, because if I do paint it, it's going to get chipped. So I'll probably paint this later, like right at the end of the job. In this clip you can see one of these excellent Blackgate's engineering spanners in action. So it's a ring spanner at one end, and an open-ended spanner at the other end, and they really are good. Everyone should have a set of these in their toolbox. This might look a bit brutal. I'm using a brass block to carefully tap this pin into place. What I generally do is assemble things and then go over everything with a spanner to make sure I haven't forgotten to tighten any of the nuts. Time now to test if everything moves smoothly. First of all, put the expansion link into the right position. And yes, everything moves very smoothly indeed. The engine rolls up and down the bench, and everything seems to be moving as it should. In this clip, I'm moving the expansion link manually, and you can clearly see the valve rod is going in and out OK. Now it's time to fit the return crank assembly. 
This return crank fits on the extended crank pin on the rear wheel, and it's vital that this doesn't move. Most of the time these are pinned in position once you get the valve timing right. I modified this return crank because originally the 4BA bolt was threaded into one half of it, and if that sheared that would be a problem. So I've drilled it all the way through, 964 of an inch, so I can use a standard 4BA bolt. And if that was to shear off, I could simply pull out the broken part and fit another one. The eccentric rod has a ball race bearing on the end of it that fastens to the return crank, so I thought I would pack it with grease before refitting it. And here it is refitted. When I built my 7.25 inch gauge titch locomotive that I run round the garden periodically, I did exactly the same, and there's no appreciable wear after many years. So now I can play trains, I can run the locomotive up and down the bench, and it's starting to make the right noise. Well, at least one side is anyway. Now I've turned the locomotive round, and guess what, I'm going to do exactly the same at this side as well. But there's a bit of a problem, if you look at this, the pins are fitted the wrong way round on this side, so I'm going to take them out and put them in the right way round. And everything was going quite well until I found out that one of these pins was fully seized up in the hole. But never mind, how difficult can it be getting this out? Well, it turned out to be very difficult, because these are small parts, and you can't just hammer them out, otherwise you're going to bend all these small parts. But finally, with an absolute minimum of ultraviolence, I got the pin out. I'm fighting the urge to just use an ordinary 4BA bolt, and you must never, ever, ever, ever do that. Always make pins, because threads do not make a good bearing surface for this job at all. So I just made a new pin in the lathe. It was a very quick job. Once again, using the small oil can with a specially extended spout, I'm lubricating all of the parts where there's going to be anything moving. And just like the other side, all of the pins are a very, very good fit. There's no slop at all. So that just reaffirms my theory that this engine has not done much running. When running a miniature steam locomotive, these are the parts that generally get neglected when it comes to oiling, so they wear out quickly. Here I'm fitting the outer motion bracket bearing that supports the expansion link, and you will notice that the expansion link shaft has a small hole in the middle of it. This hole was a bit small, so it was re-threaded to 6BA, because on the end of this shaft is a small lever, and via a rod this operates a mechanical lubricator, and the original arrangement with an 8BA bolt was not really very positive. I'll put the lever in place when I fit the mechanical lubricator, but I can't fit that until the running boards are fitted. For the moment I'm fitting the valve gear. Once the valve gear is fitted, I'm going to get the engine to run, and see how it times up. So running boards and a lubricator and any other parts really would be in the way. I have to put the brakes back on it, but they are relatively unimportant, but once again, they need to go in place before I fit the running boards. The refitting of this valve gear was done in real time when I fitted it to the right-hand side of the engine, but now the left side is just a mirror image, so I'm speeding up the process. In exactly the same way as with the right-hand side, I'm removing the eccentric rod from the return crank so I can pack the ball race with some grease. Now I'm putting it back together, and in this part of the sequence, I'm fitting the other end of the eccentric rod to the expansion link. After another bit of oiling, I want to make sure nothing wears out prematurely, especially the cylinders, so I'm pumping plenty of oil down this pipe in the smoke box, which is connected to the steam chests. Even though this workbench is just a piece of plywood and it's fairly badly damaged anyway, I didn't want to churn it up anymore, so I found a piece of track, and I'm using this to run the engine up and down on. And now it's time for even more oil, just to make sure I haven't missed any of the moving parts. And a little bit more down into the cylinders. The steam workshop is quite a noisy place, there's a lot going on at any given time, but you can still hear that the engine is now making steam locomotive noises. It seems to be breathing very nicely. In this clip I'm adding a very small amount of oil into the top outlet pipe from the water pump. I added this small amount of oil to the water pump because I don't want the ram to prematurely wear because of lack of lubrication. When the axle pump is working, when it's running and pumping water, the water becomes the lubricant. But it will be a while before I get the engine to that stage. 
And that's it for now, so thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.